Molly Arthur with CMCM, Channel 26 Public Access TV here in Marin County. And I'm at the Bioneers Conference here in uh, the Civic Center. And I'm here with Jody Evans at the Bioneers Conference. I attended yesterday her workshop, uh, Changing Stories That Create Culture and How We Tell Our Stories. So I want to welcome Jody and tell you that uh, she's the co-founder of Code Pink, Women for Peace, and is the board chair of the Women's Media Center it sits on many other boards, including those of the Rainforest Action Network, of course, one of our local organizations, uh, Institute for Policy Studies, and the Drug Policy Alliance. Welcome, Jody. Thank you for coming and joining us. So, Jody, I was wondering, so many organizations you're involved with, how is it that your involvement with all these different organizations relates to your foundational life, work, and endeavor and meaning? Well, everything I do comes out of my passion, comes out of my heart, and they've been things that I've done and then another thing has shown up. You know, I would say I was trying to end the drug war before I was trying to end the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I was trying to end the war on the planet, um, you know, at Rainforest Action Network before that. And they keep kind of growing on each other. There keeps being another fire to work on and another place to bring my skill set. And, you know, I used to be on the board of Bioneers. I do go off of boards, but not until I see that there's somebody to replace the thing that I do on them. Um, 826LA is something I founded, and um, it's very dear to my heart, an after-school writing program where hopefully there'll be a few people in the United States that can think critically, since Congress doesn't seem to be able to do that. And, you know, it just stems out of what does my heart need. And at Code Pink we say, that the only recognizable feature of hope is action. And I think that just is what's inside my body. When I see something that moves to disempower me, I move to empower myself by acting toward it. So your involvement in the organizations are a, a, a part of how you live your work and your action and your passion. Yes, and stay healthy, because engagement is how I stay healthy. What is it uh, about women's hesitation with being in the public eye? You talked about that in the workshop yesterday. Um, and how is it that uh, they can find their voices? Thinking about that. Well, I think it's very cultural. If you uh, imagine that 3% of the people who make decisions around the media you see are women, 7% uh, of the directors, 10% of the writers, 20% of the producers of the media out of Hollywood are women. We're not living inside of women's world. Women's voices aren't valued. And we internalize that. You know, many women get to be raised in different ways and find their voices strong through their community or their family, but many women don't. And it's a very cultural thing because it's, it's quite real. And at the same time, women are, you know, kind of raised to be good girls and to be pleasing and to please others. And so you have those two contradictions because when you do speak out in a different way than culture expects, um, it, there's some pushback and it doesn't feel good. And to really be able to be strong enough and vulnerable enough to do that takes work and it takes practice. And we don't always give women a lot of room for that. It's funny, we let men get away with murder, literally, and we demand so much out of women, both as women and as culture. So how, how do women find their voices then in this difficult culture? They use them. It's the only way to find your voice is to use it. And to and we need to, as women, notice where a woman is using her voice and support her and hear her. And, and, and we need to also be creating the possibilities for more women to use their voice. And that's what we do at the Women's Media Center. We were created to make the female half of the world more visible. And that started with going to the heads of networks and saying, where are the women? You know, you have all these new shows Sunday morning, it's less than 20% of the voices I hear are a woman. That's wrong. And them saying back to us, but there are no women. And instead of saying, of course there are, figuring out what does that sentence mean to them? Why would somebody say that? And seeing that, well, when they call women, they don't show up because they don't feel they're expert at something, their hair's not done, they don't have, you know, a sitter. There's all these things that get in the way of women showing up that we had to deal with with the women who want to use their voice. It's like, you know, when they call, you got to say yes. Because they call who says yes. So if you say no, you're like off the list immediately. So you've got to be willing to show up. And then um, you've got to be willing to make mistakes. And because using your voice is practice. And listening. Listening to what works. 
What do you, what moves you? How do you not show up with facts and figures, but about the story that has you engaged in this anyway? And we find too often that women don't feel the strength of their own position, so they turn to the power outside of themselves instead of turning to the power that's inside of themselves and telling the story that has them engaged in what they're passionate about. And those are actually the stories that change minds and hearts. In the workshop, you talked about uh, telling stories and how we must listen first. So how does that work? Passion and vulnerability, because it takes you know a lot of strength and vulnerability at the same time. And you talked about listening. You know, you, you, uh, somehow you need to listen before you can tell your story. We uh, we practice that. And you know, one of the things we didn't practice is when when you're listening, it's also to listen to all the things inside of you that are in the way of you telling your story. And as you start to listen to them, you start you can hear them and understand them and give them compassion and respect, there's more space for your story to be told. And I think we try to deny those voices. Um, we don't want to hear those voices because they mean going somewhere that's uncomfortable. And every time you speak, um, maybe another thing that's hidden is going to reveal itself. And you can get to a point where you're speaking where you become the vessel of what's inside of you and you cannot even you don't even know what's coming out and some of those are the most powerful speeches because you've become that vessel for truth and because you um, get out of the way and, and leave your judgments behind. How do we shift the narrative, our culture's story, and change our own story? By telling our own. It's really, the, by if you think of how many stories are silenced, if that many women aren't getting to tell their stories, we're living inside of an unreality of what is true. And so we need to change those stories by telling our own stories. And the more we tell our stories, the more, as Gloria Steinem says, we name it, the more the possibility to change it. Uh, an example, we have a campaign called Name It, Change It at Women's Media Center. And we've lived under the sexism around women running for office for you know 50, 100 years. But nobody's ever named it. And matter of fact, campaign managers say, ignore it. So we did a study that showed that if you don't ignore it, if you stand up to it powerfully and say, you know, are you, would you say that to a man? That you move up in the polls. And when you don't confront it, you move down in the polls. But this has been a way that campaigns have been run forever. And if you look at some of the tapes that we have of how the media is sexist towards women running for office, that they're not towards men, you would wonder, why does any woman even have the courage to run for office at all? And by naming that, we've been able to change it, and we've lowered in this last election the amount of sexism that media is doing for women. But that meant training them, that meant pointing it out, that meant going to every studio and showing them how bad it was. I mean, they would like scrunch under in their seats in shame because nobody had ever named it. A provocative question that came up for me in the workshop yesterday was, who are we speaking for when we're speaking up and when we found our voices? Well, that's, a, that's a, both a tool to be effective when you speak, but also a tool to reach your audience. Um, so sometimes um, when women say, I don't know how to go out, I'm really scared, what's in the way is their own fear of shame and, and whatever's in that way. If you go out knowing who you're speaking for, knowing that you're using the privilege of your voice in front of an audience to speak for those that aren't in front of that audience, you get out of the way and you become a vessel for them. And that's a great big tool to kind of get out of the way that our egos get in the way of our speaking. And then also, how do you tell the story? How will this audience, how will you bring those into this audience becomes the best way to deliver the story? Because it brings in the heart, it brings in the soul, and it brings in the connection that you're trying to make. So in your actions, then, so this ties into not only just speaking up, so I guess maybe your definition of your action is speaking up in a very clear way. Very much so. My body is my speaking to very often. So in your actions, you need to be very clear about who you're speaking for, why you're doing it, what the story is, and how you think it will actually be seen. Right, and I'll, I, a great story around that is um, before we go to do an action at Code Pink, we really stop and say, okay, who are we doing this for? Mm. Why are we doing this? And what is it that we want to be seen? Because then if we have it inside of ourselves, nothing ever happens quite how planned. It 
that is still in there. The integrity, the message is still inside of us. So the movement of where we go uh, happens more gracefully and more on point. An example of that is Condi Rice, um, when she was um, Secretary of State, was going to speak in front of Congress about the progress of the war in Iraq. And we had about 30 women staying at the Code Pink House in Washington, D.C., and we got up and we painted our hands red. We were going to sit behind her and all raise our hands and say, the blood of the Iraqi is on your hands. But we knew that was really an intense thing to do. So we had to get really inside ourselves and know who we were doing this, know we were doing it for the a million Iraqi that had died and the five million that had been displaced and about the soldiers who died and the ones that are wounded and got really into that place. But what happened was, is a librarian that was with us, when Condi went to come and sit down, was right next to her and she went to her and she said, the blood of the Iraqi are on your hands. And inside of Des was the grief, the power, the desire to help. And you saw that in her face. And so something that could be quite frightening became a picture that went around the world that spoke to what we all feel, that discomfort of our complicity in this war and, the, and that to speak it was in some way to unleash, to move out a hidden secret. And because it had that strength in the picture, it could go around the world and not be something that felt disrespectful of Condi, but respectful of the, of the global voice. And you just never know what it's going to look like. So you put your heart and your passion out there with, within a specific plan. And, and it's especially hard, you know, around ending the war because so much of what you feel is anger. Like, why are people doing this? You just want to scream. I mean, I want a primal scream is inside of me to stop this militarism and violence and killing innocent people. You have to transform that inside of you to be able to create something that can be heard. So do you change how uh, the context in which you um, speak? Do you change your language for the uh, people that you're trying to talk to? Yeah, I have to be disarming. You know, um, that's why Code Pink uses a lot of humor. If you come at somebody in resistance, you're being no different than the militarism you're trying to stop. So what we say in Code Pink is how do we be disarming? Um, a story about that is that we've been doing a hunger strike inside of Congressman Ackerman's office. He's the congressman from New York. And he was putting forth a resolution for what would be seen as an act of war. It was the closing down of the Persian Gulf a blockading of the Persian Gulf. It would have been seen from Iran as an act of war. And we've been trying everything. We've gone to Nancy Pelosi, asked her to stop. She says, oh no, that we're voting on that on Tuesday and it's gonna go through like a knife through hot butter. So over the weekend, we're just, what do we do, what do we do? Disarming, what's disarming? We found out he lived on the waterway in DC and had a houseboat. So we got dinghies and little, you know, newspaper folded hats and painted them pink and had sweet flags and we created a blockade around his boat that was very disarming very soft and you know beautiful and like a picnic and he came out at 7 30 in the morning and was blown away by what we had done because it spoke to him in a way he could hear it outside of his office in a hunger strike for some reason he just wanted to ignore us but that Going to that level of effort, the level of beauty that we brought, he had to speak to us. Spoke to us for a half an hour, really listened to what we had to say. We said, can we bring some students from Iran to your office, two o'clock in the office? The students from Iran told him what it would be in Iran and who would suffer. He killed the resolution and it's never come back again. So. So, exciting. so sometimes some of what you see is like the beginning of an action mm -hmm. that then moves further into the negotiation or other ways that that we can speak you know how how you keep the pressure on how you keep finding ways to tell the story looking for the crack that becomes the window that becomes the door that you can walk through it's, you know one step after the other too many times people think oh I, that failed because I didn't get there each thing we see is a pulling back of, the, of all the barriers that are inside or blocking power so that they can actually hear the vulnerability of the world and what they're actually doing to people globally. So it's speaking uh, truth to power. So I think we'll, we'll close now. 
you know, tell us about speaking truth to power and, and you know, a summary about inspiring us to be action oriented and to make the social change and change our cultural narrative. Well, the most important thing is, is you know, when you feel something, when you feel the grief of something that you look at and see, and right now in this world that is so easy to do because there is so much to really be sad about, about our planet, about, you know, slavery, the, 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 our consumerism, it's slaving whole countries, uh, you know, about the innocence that we kill with our weapons so that we can be free. There is so many things that it's hard to look at, so we decide to turn our face. Mm -hmm. But the only way they're going to change is to actually look at them, feel them, and then move into action. Because when you move into action, you actually are creating that like this drop of sand in the bucket that can flip power. But if you don't, not only are we stuck, but it's an agreement. And so to know in every time that you back away from acting and engaging, you're actually agreeing to this violent world we live in. I hope that encourages everyone to stay engaged, to use their voice, to find ways to work together, and to watch it not the big way. We don't, we don't change the big. We change what's next to us, and that moves the big. So it's not to be overwhelmed by how big the problem is, but to be inspired by what's happening directly next to you. Thank you so much, Jody. Thank you. It's a beautiful, beautiful message and an important world that we can see with beauty and truth. Thank you. Hi, this is Molly Arthur with CMCM, Channel 26 Public Access TV here in Marin County. And I'm at the Bioneers Conference here in uh, the Civic Center. And I am going to be interviewing Alyssa Parker. And she's the um, president of C. Jane Do, a new social change organization. And she just put on a women's conference called Passion Into Action up in Grass Valley. She's also launched TEDx Grass Valley and is an alumnus of the Women's Media Center Progressive Women's Voices program. And uh, Alyssa, welcome. I know that you gave, uh, I put on a conference just a couple of weeks ago, and um, I wanted to ask you about the conference. How did it go, and what is it about women in passion? What is it about women in passion? Yeah, yeah I'm, so I'm the co-founder and um, host of the Passion to Action Women's Conference. And I mean, I think right now it's a vital time for women to come together. I mean, we have an election year uh, and there's something going on in the world right now. I don't know if it's the vibration or it's just the sense of urgency for everybody, but there's that whole, you know, the fight or flight mentality. And for men typically under stress, uh, studies have shown that they either go into isolation, like in the workplace, go into the office. Women, it's the water cooler effect where we actually come together and we want to talk. So I correlate that with what's going on in the world. Women want to be together. We want to connect. And more than that, right now, we need to bring forth our passions and purpose. And part of that is, part of that is putting into action. It's one thing to know what resonates in your heart. 
but what's so needed right now in the world for us as women is to get it out there whether that's in your community with your families on a larger scale running for office running a business uh, or just serving on the board of your kids pta fund so uh, passion to action has been an extraordinary opportunity for me to share my passion with other women and our main keys were this year was to belong to inspire and to ignite so that women feel like they're part of large something larger than themselves that they can inspire their passions into action and that they can really ignite those so we had hundreds of women come together uh, in grass valley california and it helps serve women in rural communities in small town america which is something that we typically don't get to have access to these amazing incredible women and then we also engage women, local leaders there to help provide the workshops. So you're getting the tips and tools, the information, and the inspiration all at once. So I, I understand that you took the training with the um, Women's Media Center, the Progressive Women's Media Center. Um, tell me a little bit about that training and why, why women need training to find our voice and to feel capable of being action and visible. Well, it's really important right now for women to to find our stories and to share those. And really the premise for me and being a co-founder of See Jane Do, you know, it's all about the everyday women doing extraordinary things and using the power of story to create positive change. Stories are what reshape our lives. And as women, that's often how we communicate with each other. So often in the media right now, um, you know, it's it's I hate to say it, but it's pretty much run by the guys. And so when you think about 9% of 9% of the leadership are women in media. So who's telling our story? Who is shaping our story? And how do they even know what women are thinking? So knowing that and having two daughters and wanting to have a platform for their voice, I that was really my whole push to get passion and to get passion to action and also see Jane Do out there and having a grant funded radio show to help get the stories of women out because we connect with stories and we connect through our emotions. And so I took it up on myself to say, you know what? We need to hear the stories from women. Every single woman needs to get out there and tell her story if we're gonna make a shift in the world. So tell us about the shift in the world that you want. The shift in the world that I want right now, I mean, I want an equal playing field and that looks different for all of us. But most important is I want women to feel, and girls, to feel like they can stand in their own power that they have value in their lives. So whatever that might look like for each of us is gonna be very different. We're all gonna have different purposes and passions. Often women don't associate themselves as being activists. And I want women to feel like they can be activists in their own lives and that they can take the lead in their life. It doesn't mean that you're out there at the front of you know, rallying the troops sometimes. It could just mean you're taking a lead in your life for being a good person, for um, helping with your family or taking care of your parents or ensuring that you have good food on the table. Um, most important though is the media aspect. You know, you were talking about the media and just making sure we hear about those stories. Because as women, I think sometimes we feel like we're alone in that. Um, and that sisters don't have our backs. And I want women to know that other women are experiencing exactly what you're experiencing and that we have your back and that we'll be there for you. And that's part of See Jane Do, that's part of Passion to Action. You spoke with Jody Evans of the Women's Media Center and that's what the Women's Media Center is doing is making sure that women are on the same platform as the guys and that you have a chance to hear our stories as well. Thank you so much. For yeah, your, you're welcome. For your passion, for your work, for your uh, support for women, and for having our back and teaching us how to do it better. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Molly. Thank you.